hard part of the Christmas story. We've had the wonderful, incredible um, stories, according to Luke, of shepherds and angels filling the sky. We had the moment just now in Matthew of a star being seen in wise men following after it, and all of the wonder and the awe, and then we come to this part of the story, and life comes back in, right? That bubble that we can't keep for very long. Um, because the world is as it is, and there is pain, and there is evil, and there is injustice then as much as there was now. And we hit up against that in today's story. For as much as the new year has turned, and we are in with a beginning of 2017, we still have old problems that have not gone away. There is still evil that is present. And so we come to today's gospel story to figure out how to be in the middle of the both and of it all. You see, what I love about Matthew's story is you have bookends with the Magi and Herod. And God didn't change who the Magi were, and God didn't change who Herod was. You have the Magi. We don't know exactly who they were, wise men, priests, kings. We do know that they came from a different land, of a different culture, of a different language, of a different religion. And they were the ones who had done all the seeking out and they found what they were seeking. And they spent time adoring and giving ridiculously lavish and amazing gifts to the gift of God that... No one would have expected them to seek after or know who's so far outside the bounds of their daily world and their daily lives and what they, if we want to put in quotes, should be aware of. It's the promise of the infinite capacity in humanity, that awe that opens us up and sets us free and invites us into the wonder of what we can accomplish and the beauty and the gifts that can be given. And then on the other side, we have Herod, who never was very secure in his rule, and who had all of the descendants of the Hasmoneans killed so that there could be no question to his power or his authority or his throne. He fought long and hard for that, and he established security forces around him and forces, fortresses in many of the cities so that there would be a refuge he could go to that wouldn't ever be too far away. And when he suspected intrigue in his own family, he killed one of his wives and his sons. And then when he found out that he was dying, he ordered that there be political prisoners killed on the day of his deaths to ensure that there would be mourning throughout the land. As much as we have an example of the wonder and the beauty of humanity, we also have an example in Herod of the brutal violence and the crippling fear that shut him down and that he did everything to shut others down around him. We are very much in the both and of the hope and of the fear of beauty and of violence. And this is a mix that was as present when Jesus was born as it is now. And it is a mix that will continue happening and going until God comes again in final victory and what we pray for every Sunday and hopefully every day becomes true. That God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But until then, we are faced with wailing and Rama. We are faced with mothers and families who have experienced what no one should. Who are going through the unimaginable. And Epworth, you have had your own share of those stories and those experiences this year and in your history. You know what it is like when evil turns our world upside down. You know the pain and the terror that is there. You know the anguish of one son being warned in a dream and fleeing and safe to Egypt, but what about all of the other sons and what about all of the other mothers and families? 
This is a heavy, heavy story today. But it is just as much a gift as the shepherds and the angels and the magi. Because this is the story of Emmanuel, of God with us when everything goes wrong. And this is the story of how we get through those moments. I've been reading a lot about, um, and have reread now, actually, The Shack. Do any of you know it, especially now that the movie has come out? I really liked that book. Um, and there are a lot of good quotes and moments in it. But this is the day where that question of theodicy comes up again. Why would God allow such an evil thing to happen? And it is a question that the shack explores through a father who has lost his daughter to a kidnapping and, and a murder. How do we find God in the midst of that unimaginable, unexplainable, unjust world? And in one of the moments, God talking to the father, and when he's demanding answers, says, I'm not here to explain. I'm here to redeem. And that is one of the simplest, most liberating ways that I understand these heavy stories. Because we are caught in the midst of the both and, and we can get into free will and the philosophical arguments and all that means, but God didn't change who the Magi were and God didn't change who Herod was, but God changed who God was. God did what only God could do and came and took on humanity in the most vulnerable form of a baby who needed to be protected just as much as he had come to protect us, like Kaylee told us. God did what God could do, and God was Emmanuel, God with us. And we know the redemption story of Jesus and of Mary and Joseph and their flight to Egypt. But where I've been stuck this week is what are the redemption stories of those other mothers who were left? And so if you engage with me in a little meaning searching, we won't ever know their story. Scripture hasn't told us them. But there are other stories that we do know. And what I was struck by was that um, scholars think that since Bethlehem was such a small town, we were probably talking about 20 kids, 20 boys being killed which is the exact number of the children at Sandy Hook Elementary School who were killed four years ago. And we know how some of those mothers and families have survived. Time Magazine told the story of Joanne Bacon a year ago and how they worked through that period of how they became so fiercely private and were suspicious of anyone and how the spiral of grief took them and shrunk their world, and how they struggled to figure out how to be a parent to a living son, Guy, and a non-living daughter, Charlotte, and how they found their way forward again when Guy returned to school and there were therapy dogs there to help him be able to readjust and work through his anxiety and feel safe again, and how much Charlotte loved dogs and so how they established Charlotte's litter so that they could work to work with other schools so that more therapy dogs would be there for more children to help them work through the evils that they faced and for those who hadn't flown away to Egypt or escaped. There is deep evil and pain and violence and there is great hope and beauty. And the hardest part as disciples, as followers of Christ, is being able to hold both together. But for Joanne and the awful thing that happened to her, she was able to work and to give a gift and to continue forward. And that story is embedded in our country. We have the famous musical Hamilton who, that has brought to life some of our history that um, we have not remembered. And his wife, Eliza, who lost her son, Philip, and her husband to gun violence and wasn't able to be the mother that she would have wanted to be to Philip, but founded the first private orphanage in New York City and was that mother for over 700 other children. 
And then we have Julia Ward Howe in 1870, who issued a mother's call for peace, appalled by the violence and the death that she had seen in the Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War, and called for all mothers of the world to unite. And we'll hear more about that declaration on Mother's Day and what that day was founded for in uniting all of those who have wailed and who have mourned and who want something different. And we have Eleanor Roosevelt who lost her parents at a very early age and her younger brother who went through um, the affair and the polio and still was the first delegate to the United Nations from the United States and worked on the Commission of Human Rights and was a part of that universal document declaration of what human rights were and protecting that for others all around the world. And it's not limited, of course, to the United States. We have right now Jim Estill in Canada who saw the crisis in Syria and made a commitment to bring 50 families, 200 people to Canada and began an own, his own nonprofit, Ease Into Canada, and used what he knew as a businessman with his factory to help get people the safety and the jobs that they needed as they were in crisis. Something that's formed a way of doing that that others have picked up to replicate to give more aid all around the world. There are so many stories. There are so many moments, too many moments, where we will have that our world ends and we have to work through the unimaginable. But I want to think of those women, those mothers wailing today, not as victims, but as witnesses of God's redeeming work. We don't know their story, and there are so many stories that we don't know. But what we do know is that God is Emmanuel, God is with us, and as much as all the evil that is present, there are those who encounter the curse and who stop it in their lives. There are those who undo the roots of evil and take out the thorns and even in the midst of exhausted soil are able to plant a new hope and a new beginning and a new way forward, who are able to break the cycle of violence for the rest of us so that those shut down places don't stay that way, but that there is an opening for us to find the beauty and the wonder and the awe that the Magi remind us are just as present as the other moments. And so with daring courage, we are called to step into this new year, into all the old problems that still remain, but with a new hope that God is Emmanuel, that God is with us, and that there is someone that will walk this journey with us, no matter how violent it becomes, and will redeem it and bring forth new hope and new life and new possibility as only God can do. This is the good news. Christ is born in the midst of the both and of it all. And I like to think that as we go through this journey and as we hear his teaching, the very first sermon, the te first teaching Jesus gave included a sharing of blessing. And when he said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted I can't help but think that he was thinking of those women in Rama that day. So may there be blessing for all of us, no matter what we experience in this world. May we know that there is a God who is redeeming.